So, hello. Uh, it's my second time here, but the first one was when I was 16, and that was a long time ago. Uh, so, kind of the first time here. I'm very happy to see you. Uh, so, as uh, I, I, I was already introduced, that I will be talking about extending WordPress in the right way. Uh, so, first of all, uh, who am I and why I dare talk about <laughs> these things? Uh, so, I'm, I'm usually saying that I'm one of the loudest people in the Baltics who talk about WordPress. That's because I talk a lot. Uh, I've g been giving talks all, all across Scandinavia and also in Riga and uh, in my hometown in Konas. I've been uh, one, one of the organizers of a local meetup there. Uh, I'm also one of the editors of Lithuanian WordPress translations and one of the co-hosts of a podcast about WordPress in Lithuanian as well. So, as you can tell, I talk a lot. <laughs> Uh, I'm also a WordPress plugin developer. I've been doing that for a very long time. The first version I've worked with was 2.6.3. So also a very long time ago, more than 10 years now. Uh, my bills are getting paid by Kayak, where I, I work on their content platform, which is also based on WordPress. And in my non-existing free time, I also build free and maybe cheap tools for plugin developers and theme developers in WordPress space as well. Yeah. So, uh, first of all, let's see uh, what we have here. Who of you think of yourself as a WordPress developer? Okay, that's a good start. <laughs> yeah, uh, because uh, what, what I'm s uh, saying about this talk, this, this is mostly aimed at people who are starting out and maybe want to be a developer or are already starting and want to have some more basic knowledge about how things work there. So uh, at least I won't be preaching to the choir because it was, I was giving the same talk in Oslo and I said who thinks they are a developer and was like everybody in the room. Okay, that <laughs> would be hard. So I hope it will, you'll find this really useful. And let's clarify one thing, what I mean by a developer, that's people who actually write code. Because a lot of times in WordPress space we have people who call themselves developers, uh, but they are just basically installing themes, plugins, and trying to make them work together via configuration and, and things, and maybe writing a little bit of CSS. Uh, so we are going to talk about code, but the very basics of it not something that's really hard and, and that you have to know a lot about. Okay, so the way the story starts usually is you want to build a website. Uh, you find a theme that you like, you find some plugins that do what you want to do, put everything together, get something that works quite nice. Uh, and you, a lot of times that's enough for a client and they're happy. And that's why uh, doing that, you can also make a lot of money. And people who do that, they are always my best clients because when they can't uh, make everything the way they want and they have to go into code, then they ask me. Uh, so what this, this story starts at that point when your client comes to you and says, this is really nice, I love this, but can't we move this like 10 pixels to the side? Or can we do this? Or can we do that? This one small thing. And that's then you have to go into the code because this is something that options don't help you do. Uh, so let's start with this. <laughs> one simply does not modify the core. Uh, the general rule is uh, in WordPress space. Yeah, so the general rule is uh, if a particular piece of code uh, is if there is a chance that it will get an update for the, from the original developer of that code, you should never touch it. And what that translates into is that in the ideal world, world you should never modify a WordPress theme. Uh, if you want to make changes to how it works and looks, we can use child themes for that. Uh, you should never modify WordPress plugins. Uh, because you can usually extend them y using uh, action and filter hooks. And you should never, ever, ever, ever modify WordPress core files. And if the first two of those are a little bit negotiable, and there are cases where sometimes you might want to do something, if you want to break this one, just don't. 
Never ever do that. Uh, okay, so if we try to do that uh, and ne never modify those things that I've just talked about, so where do I put my code? The awesome code that I want to do so just that button goes 10 pixels to the left. Or that there is no button, no button there anymore or something like that. Uh, well, basically there are several places where you can do that. Uh, a child theme, uh, a functions PHP file. Uh, there is a plugin called My Custom Function. I probably shouldn't talk about that one, but, <laughs> but yeah, let's talk about all of them. And also you can do a custom plugin. So these should be your four options when you're look at looking at extending WordPress. Some of them are better than others, and I'll try to explain why. So do you know what a child theme is in WordPress? Anybody? OK, yeah, I'm very happy. Uh, because usually, even in the Oslo room where the everybody was a developer, it was like less than 30% people knew what that is. So, and I have no idea why. And that, that's basically why this part of the talk came about. Because this is something that uh, has been in WordPress for a very long time. It is a WordPress theme that extends and builds on another theme. Uh, and with it, you can change the templates that you want to and keep everything else from the parent theme and use those. And what that means, and that is very important, you can safely update the parent theme. And uh, this was introduced in WordPress 2.7, so very, very, very long time ago. And I have no idea why so many people still don't, don't know about that. Uh, so, uh, can any theme be used as parent and extended with child theme? Uh, in theory, yes. Th just, that's just how WordPress works. For any theme, uh, you can start and create a, a theme uh, and declare that it uses uh, another theme as a parent. Uh, but that there is one asterisk mark. If the original theme developer was doing things in the right way, according to best practices and recommendations. So in WordPress.org directory, if the theme is uh, not 10 years old there and has been updated over the times, uh, it is required for a theme to be uh, compatible being a parent theme, or otherwise it wouldn't get in at all. So these are the ones that you should probably start with. Uh, and there are several themes that have been designed to be a parent theme uh, in the first place. So that's like Genesis, Divi, Themeify, and some of others. So how do I create, I, do I create one? So we start uh, with a new directory in uh, WP Content Themes. Uh, usually I recommend people to use just the theme name and child or maybe your project name, something that signifies that but keep the, or the original name of the theme in, so it's an easy indicator that these two dep depend on each other and belong next to each other. So 2016 child, Genesis child, or something like that. Uh, next step, create a style CSS file. And the important thing is uh, you have to have the theme header there, because without that file, no theme will work in WordPress. Uh, it has to have that file and that theme header. Otherwise, it will show up under broken themes in your WordPress install. And the next step is just this one line. Template and the name of the theme that you're extending. By name, I mean the directory name. So it's, uh, if it's 2019, it will be 2019. If it's Genesis, it will be Genesis, and so on. Uh, and then you activate it. And that's, in a very, very basic thing, it's, it's a theme that's actually working. But at this point, it doesn't actually extend anything because we haven't created any files there. So it uses everything from parent theme. Everything, every single file comes from a parent theme. So the next step is to create modified templates. If you want to make changes in the original theme's uh, single.php template, so the one that uh, shows up, shows the single uh, article, so what you do is you copy over that file from the original theme into your child theme and make changes there. 
So at this point, WordPress will use that particular template from your child theme and all the other files from the original theme. Uh, you can also create a functions.php file, and it will work the same way as it works in uh, a parent theme. It will be loaded just before they load the, the functions.php file of the parent theme. So child theme functions.php, then parent themes functions.php file. Uh, it will not override it. It will go next one next to each other. Uh, and also, you might want to create a screenshot. So screenshot.png or JPEG or GIF, uh, three to f uh, four to three aspect ratio, and just uh, just something to show what your theme will look like a little bit. Uh, okay, so uh, why use this? This is because you can always update your parent theme. So you can get all the new functions, all the security updates, everything that the developer of the original theme gives you, you can always have that. And nothing will get lost, because one, one of the fears why you can't usually can't update a site is because you have modified something, and if you update, things will disappear. So if the changes are in a the child theme, they will not disappear if you try to up, if you update it. Uh, if your parent theme has changes in the files that you modified and copied over, uh, then you can do like a diff comparison and move them over to your change as well. But you can do this at your own pace and uh, again, your changes don't disappear. You can compare, see what's changed and make changes if you need them. So I've given here a few links. Uh, one is to the uh, developer handbook on WordPress.org, which is a re really nice resource. It has been updated in the last few years. Uh, if you've looked at Codex, that was very, very old school, but now the developer handbooks are really nice and uh, cleaned up a lot. Uh, Smashing Magazine has also a very nice resource about how to do that. And if you like to learn via video, there is also a video there for you. And Good luck, just start creating them. And never, ever, ever modify a theme that you haven't created. Never again. OK, uh, the next place where I mentioned that you can put your changes in is the functions.php file. Uh, it's a file in any WordPress theme where you can, and I have an asterisk there, put custom, custom code in. Uh, it is loaded with every page load in WordPress, even if it's not a front-end uh, page, even in the, in the back-end, it's still getting loaded. So it is kind of a dangerous file, because a mistype in this file can bring your whole site down. So if you ever try to make changes in it uh, via the editor that is in VP Admin, and if your WordPress version is, I think, less than 5.2, then you could easily get yourself locked out because you have widescreen of death and you cannot do anything about it anymore. Uh, the good thing is in the latest version, we have some uh, secur security updates that do not allow you to save a change that breaks the site this way. So that's a good thing. But fr from my opinion, that editor should never have been in the core at all, <laughs> because it's just invitation for user to break things. Uh, but it, this file is getting loaded at every page load, so any code you put there gets executed every time. So be very, not I would say careful, but just circumspect. Just think about if you really need it there. Uh, but it is a very good place if you want to make small presentation specific changes. Something that has directly to do so with how things are presented. It is not a good place to put functionality changes because changes will go away if you change your theme ever. So if in this file you ever put things like uh, creating a new, po new post type, as some themes do. For example, you have a theme that has a portfolio part in it, and then it creates a, a custom post type there, and you upload a lot of nice things about what you have done, and then you decide to switch to a different theme, and then you don't see it anymore. It doesn't exist anymore at all. That's because the code that has been creating that post type 
is no, no, no more loaded and it, and it doesn't work. So the only way to get it back is to activate the old theme again and then do some kind of export or copy code over from one function's PHP file to another. So, and also it will be overwritten with an update. So again, you made some nice changes, made the, the site look the way you want, but you updated the theme and the, all the changes went away. So you have to be careful about just doing that in the parent theme. In child theme, it's easier and better, but again, for presentation changes, not for functional changes in, in the WordPress uh, installation. And 5,000 lines of code and 56 includes in functions PHP is never a good idea. And this is not out of thin air. I have worked with a site that had that. Uh, that's because I like a challenge. So I've worked on it for f four months. I got it down to about 1,000 lines and 23 includes or something, and then I gave up. I said, just look for another guy who likes a challenge. <laughs> yeah, uh, because at this point, it, it you'll have a lot of problems there. Uh, you have to be careful about including new things in, in there. So functions PHP is nice, but be careful about it. Uh, yeah, this is also a bad idea. <laughs> uh, there is a plugin uh, in WordPress.org repository that you can download, and it will uh, allow you to enter code in VP admin that will get executed. Uh, and the good thing about this, the only good thing about it, is that it will the code will stay if you switch themes. So the same example with a uh, new post type or things like that. Uh, you switch a theme, things stay. Uh, but the very bad problem is it uses eval to do that. And if you know anything about PHP security, you know you, you should never use that. And it stores the code snippets in the database, so you don't have to have uh, file access. You just need to have VP admin access, and you can write additional code into your WordPress installation. So if somebody guessed your admin password, they have full access to your site with that. Uh, so what's left? Why is ML bad? Because you can you can run any kinds of code in there, and if you, you can if you can modify changes in database, as we could with the bug in uh, uh, 4.2, then you can run any kind of code, any kind of malicious code in there. There is one thing that uh, I have especially noticed that uh, with PHP, if you ever get any code into eval, uh, then it is terribly slow. But that's also true. Like, like, that's like also order true. of magnitude slower, or may maybe not exactly, but uh, several, several times. Yeah. Because uh, if PHP is running from, uh, from a file, like your functions PHP, it is basically, let's say, compiled, not exactly, but something yeah. like that. So it runs fast. If it is in this eval way, then it is e interpreted each time. Yeah. So basically, you can imagine that you're putting in some kind of loops of uh, posts, yeah. and it will be running yeah. over and over. So I've, I've, I've found uh, terribly slow sites, thanks to that. That's, that that's also notes. true, yeah. OK, so what's left? Because well, we said you shouldn't put functions into any of the above. So the last thing is you can write a custom plugin. And that might sound scary at first, but if you can, run, if you can write a functions PHP file, you can write a plugin. That's just it. Uh, it's no, no more complicated. So it's just a plugin that you write. Uh, and it's, it, in its basic form, it can be just a single PHP file in that directory. And if you ever looked at, at the directory, there is one just like that. It's called Hello Dolly. It's just a single file, nothing else. Uh, so the only thing that PHP file needs is a plugin header, and it looks a, a lot like theme header. Uh, just code, code names are a little bit different. So plugin, and out of those two, uh, just this one is really required. All other are kind of optional. Uh, it's just information that gets displayed to user, then they go to a plugins list. Uh, so 
you just put this, and then afterwards put any PHP code you want, the same way that you would have done in functions.php file. So why is it better to put code into plugin and not in functions.php? It's because it stays activated and it stays active when you switch themes. And it gives you a lot more reusability because you can use the same plugin over and over in different, uh, in different environments and different sites. And so what I like to do, uh, you can also, it's not a very good idea if you have a lot of different modifications that you use to put everything into a single plugin. Uh, a lot of times I hear that said, so the number of plugins is a bad thing. Uh, it is in a sense that if you see that user has a lot of plugins, they most of the time have a lot of bad plugins installed. But uh, if you are circumspect on what you actually uh, activate, I could find a hundred plugins that I could activate and they would slow your site less than one bad one. So it's all a little bit relative. So what I like to do is uh, I write uh, for every different function that I create, uh, so functionality part, I create separate plugins. So that, that way they are much more reusable, like Legos. So you put it from one site to another and, and so on. Uh, and then you can reuse. So for one site, you might need three of the things that you wrote. For other, you might need five. For the another one, you, you might need only one. And then you can move them around between the sites that you, that you are managing. And so, and good thing, it's, it's not, it does not get uh, overwritten with updates. It does not get uh, turned off accidentally when switching themes and so on. It just stays there, so you have more control. And it's, as I said, it's no harder than writing a functions PHP file. Uh, and then, after we get, so how do we extend WordPress in a plugin? Uh, basically, there are three ways. There are pluggable functions, there are action hooks, and there are filter hooks. So how many of you have heard what a pluggable function is? Okay, <laughs> that's good. Uh, Pluggable functions are something that was created to extend WordPress before we figured out hooks. Uh, so a function is a WordPress function that can be overwritten by a theme or a plugin. Uh, they all can be found in this file. Uh, and what you have is, uh, what you can do in a, in a theme or a plugin, you can create a function with the same name and WordPress will use yours instead of the one that it has in core. Uh, so this way you can modify WordPress functionality in a, a lot of different ways. For example, change the way that they generate the password or a lot of different things. I think there are more than 100 of those in there. Uh, but the problem is, with this setup, it worked really nicely when WordPress had like 20 plugins available at all. Now we have 50,000 that you can choose from. And the problem is only one plugin can overwrite a function. If you have two, then you have two functions with the same name. And you do you know what PHP does when there is a two functions with the same name? Yeah, it's a fatal error. <laughs> yeah, so you can't have that. So the problem is, uh, the one who is fastest to do that, that one wins. The other ones lose and you have a broken site. So when you have a lot of different plugins trying to do similar things, and user uh, activates on average at least 25 or 30 plugins on a site nowadays, then you have a problem with this approach. Because only one can use this. So this became obvious like a year after they created plugins at all and so they moved away from this but because of backward compatibility we still have a lot of functions that we can extend this way uh, so, and sometimes we have to use that because hooks don't get us there at that point but if you can avoid try avoiding this one so we go co to hooks uh, and before we talk about hooks, it's important to talk a little bit about design patterns. Uh, so a, a lot of times when developers come to WordPress from uh, like Laravel or another framework, the first question is, is where is my MVC? 
model view controller. And the problem is that WordPress doesn't use MVC because when WordPress was being built, uh, it hasn't been that popular at that point, and they chose to use a different thing that's called event-driven architecture. So basically, whenever is a WordPress page load happening, there are a lot of different events firing, and as a programmer, you can hook your code to any event that you want. So you say, uh, so WordPress is doing this, I wanted to do this also. WordPress is doing this, I wanted to do this also. And you can hook the the good the big advantage over pluggable function, uh, functions is that instead of being able to hook one thing to a hook, to to in a pluggable function, you can hook multiple things in there. So plugins don't have to compete to with who is first. They can just all live nicely together. Uh, so when you understand that this is how it works, then it gets easier to work with WordPress a lot. So. Uh, as I said, you can put your code pretty much in any point in WordPress execution you want. From very, very beginning to the hook called shutdown, that's just literally the last thing that WordPress does. Yeah, and they come in two flavors, action and filter hooks. Uh, they are very similar, and underneath they kind of use the same structure and architecture, but they have some differences there. Uh, so action hook is a point uh, where you are allowed to modify certain functionality. Uh, so you, you just say, I want this code executed at this point, and you can maybe print something out uh, there and do things like that. So a good example is and action VP head. So whenever WordPress prints out, uh, executes the VP head function in uh, in the theme, you can say also do this, also do that, also do something. And in this example, what it does, it just prints out a comment that says hello. Not very useful, I know, but you can put different things in there, like meta tags and all kinds of things. Uh, so what's the difference with the filter hook? Well, if that if uh, action hook just lets you execute things and do your own thing, uh, with the filter hook, you can modify the data that WordPress is operating with. So for example, if uh, WordPress is printing the title of an article, you can take that value, do something it, and return it back to the mix so that WordPress can carry on doing its own thing, but the data is now different a little bit. Again, not too useful example. It just puts a smiley face at the, at, the, at the end of every title because we could use more smiles, couldn't we? <laughs> yeah, but here you can do also a lot of different things with titles and so on. Uh, in WordPress, very, very deep underneath, menu items are also posts. So for menu items, this also applies. So be careful when doing things because you can end up with menus having something you, that you weren't expecting them to. Uh, another thing that is important here, as I said, that, warp, that plugins don't have to compete which one gets loaded first, is because you can set uh, the priority when each function gets executed on that hook. So if you have three functions that are hooked on the same hook, you can say which one goes first by having it in a lower priority number. So nine goes before 10 and that goes before 90. So just put any number in. And you can actually use fractions here. That's sometimes useful. And also there is uh, a third parameter that says how many uh, arguments do you want to get. Because sometimes you don't care with additional parameters that the hook is sending and just want the one or, or so. Oh, also, and priority by default is 10. So if you don't say what priority is, it's 10. So if you want to go uh, earlier, you have to say less than 10. If you want to go later than most of the plugins, you have to go more than 10. Okay, so where can, I, can you hook? Uh, there are more than 2,500 hooks at, at this point. So the short answer is everywhere. And we get more of those with every re release, every new version. 
and I've been guilty of adding one or two myself there. Uh, so WordPress developer reference has a list, but the best place to look is actually to go into the code. I have links there to both of those things. And it's, as a developer, it's also very good whenever you're hooking into something in WordPress, just go into that place and read like 10 lines above, 10 lines below, just so you get what's happening there and where you are sticking your hand into. Because you would never read like whole sort source code of WordPress, right? It's too much work. But doing this every time, you get to read parts of it and get the understanding what's happening there uh, just step by step by step naturally. So it's a very good habit just to go to and look what's happening there. If you see a new hook that you haven't seen before, just go in and see what happens what happened around, around it. Uh, there is a very good plugin. How many of you uses that? Query monitor. Okay, one, just two. Okay, show everybody else. If you are developing in WordPress, I, I don't know how you work without it. Uh, so this functionality that I show here is just one small feature of it. But as a developer in your development environment, you just have to have it. It, it shows all kinds of debug information in a very, ha very handy format. Uh, and one of those functions is uh, on any page load, you can go into hooks part of it, and it will show you all the action hooks that have been executed in the order that they have been executed. So, and all the functions that have been hooked to that. So you can always see what's happening at what point, and maybe you're hooking too late or too early, or so you have maybe pick a different hook or change your priority or something, because that helps a lot of times uh, to debug and fix problems. Okay. Okay. Just, uh, move this from, uh, okay. Outside, so. Okay. Yeah. So two mics now. <laughs> okay. So this also I have a link here, and I share the slides afterwards. So uh, just use that. Uh, John Blackburn, the guy who makes it, is really awesome guy and gives a lot of updates for it. So it's always has new features in it. Uh, so ca sometimes you also want to trigger a hook. So you want in your own code to happen the same things that happen in WordPress itself. And that's also really is easy to do because there are basically two functions. One is called do action. So if you want to do WordPress to do the same thing in your custom template or whatever, you just say do action VP head and WordPress will print out exactly the same as it would print in your theme header. Uh, and the same way with filters, you just use apply filters. So if you want WordPress to do all the same things it does to a title, you just say the title and then pass your, your data that you want to get modified. And the beauty of this is also you can make your own hooks. So in your code, in your plugins, in your themes, you can also create new hooks and say that this is something that my plugin does and this is some data that my plugin works this. And what it helps with is other developers that come after you and use your own code or want to extend your own code, they don't have to go in and modify it by hand. They can also hook in and use the hooks to upgrade, extend, and modify how your plugin or your theme works. So to recap, uh, you should never modify the code that is maintained by other people. That includes WordPress core themes and plugins. You can extend it using child themes, pluggable functions, and action and filter hooks. Uh, best places for custom code is a child theme for theme-specific the presentational code and custom plugins for everything else. Uh, action hooks allow you to modify WordPress functionality. Uh, filter hooks allow you to modify data. And remember, you might not be the only one hooking in, so play, play nice uh, with other people. And use hook triggers to make your own code extendable, and you can create your own hooks. So as Apple used to say, there is always a hook for that. Any questions?
Yes? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so there is one thing that you should do when you are developing your parent theme, is you should uh, wrap your own functions that you are creating in, in the theme in uh, if function ex exists clause, because that way. Uh, child themes functions PHP file gets executed before, so you can redefine that function before the uh, parent theme gets loaded, and so you can use that from the child theme. So even when they both have parent theme as the functions PHP, also. Yeah, yeah, that's, yeah. That's not, that's yeah. So, uh, but it uh, it gets loaded with functions PHP file because it gets included from functions PHP file. So it gets executed after the child theme gets executed. So, and if you use if function exists, so it already exists and it doesn't get redeclared. So that's some, one of the tricks I wanted to use in the second part that we were trying to do. <laughs> Any more? Any more questions? Well, I, I don't have an article about that. <laughs> uh, there are like four or five recordings of this talk, but it's also almost the same things. But uh, for theme, for child themes, I've linked several things in there. And if you want more details about hooks and things, you can always write to me, and I'm happy to discuss. And uh, as you probably mentioned, that there is the developer documentation, which has yeah. the full plugin, plugin API, and and everything is actually pretty well uh, uh, described. Yeah, it is documented very extensively, but the problem with that is sometimes it's easy to get lost, and sometimes it's, it's good to ask questions so that people who know more can point you to some places in there. Yeah. Any more questions? More questions? Yes? Uh, well, most of those plugins, uh, so the one, the worst, yeah, yeah, but so there are very, uh, there are a lot of bad ways to do things uh, a lot of the time, so there is not one thing that they can do bad. Uh, one, one that I saw who, that was particularly bad was injecting a where clause to every SQL query in WordPress that was doing a search in post content like uh, with uh, uh, like statements. So it's, if you have a site that has like 500 posts, it, you can have a front page that loads 14 seconds. Reading from uh, 100 files, it's so much faster than uh, doing like statements in, in MySQL. So yeah, so it, every time it depends. Good plugins often try to do things uh, not on read, not not when they display things, but when you write, because that's so much better and efficient. But it depends on the plugin. So because we can change so many things, it's very hard to define one single pattern. Uh, basically, what you should do is you should should measure uh, your performance all the time. So the query monitor can let you do that pretty easily. You can s so see some basic stats, how many queries, how much did it take to generate the page. And if you enable the plugin and you see a big drop in performance, it is doing something bad. And then you have to decide, do you really need that functionality or can you live without it? Or is it worth the drop in performance? I'd add one, one thing to the question regarding the number of uh, files. And it's namely that uh, since uh, PHP something or another, there is a thing called uh, opcaching, uh, which is uh, caching uh, all of these loaded files. And when you're thinking, oh, there is a huge number of files to load, then uh, actually you can uh, tell it like it doesn't have to go even far 
check if the files have changed for 10 seconds or I don't know, for one hour or whatever. I think the default is like two seconds or something like that. So basically you can imagine if you can set a timeout that it doesn't look for files even. So you can basically delete the files and it will be still running. So the number of files isn't uh, a question in any way. So it's uh, kind of one thing I have been also wrongly afraid of uh, is that, okay, there are so many files. Like the, your question about the functions PHP with 5,000 lines. Is it a problem if I'm breaking it down into smaller chunks? No, it's very good. It doesn't uh, change the overall code if it's in uh, multiple files. But what it makes especially good is if you are using uh, uh, Git for version management, then if there are smaller files, there is probably more possibilities that different developers are working on different... Yeah, uh, less merge conflicts, yes. Yeah, <laughs> less, less merge conflicts, and merge conflicts are something which is actually making people more suicidal. So, <laughs> yeah, so, so this true. is uh, definitely, especially then uh, when the deadline is close. Yeah, so, and I, when I mentioned that in the functions PHP, I didn't mean it just because of number of files, but when you have that many code and that many includes, that probably means that you run like 20,000 lines in total. Yeah, but uh, uh, PHP is running very fine with, uh, for example, Magento, and I think Magento's typical install is like, I don't know, 30k files. At least they are telling that the opcache must be able to handle 30k files. So this is not an... Uh, not an issue at all. If you have a question that uh, the PHP is not running optimally, then you need to uh, check your opcache status. There are tools for that. We can sometimes talk about that. And you will be seeing if everything is fitting nicely into the cache. And if it is fitting, then there is uh, no problem from that side at all. So. Yeah. Any more questions? No, you all are now, you, you started with uh, not being developers, everybody is now a developer and is able to use uh, child themes and uh, hooks and uh, so. whatever. Yeah, and you can get those slides also. Uh, I think Peter will uh, yeah. I'll, share I'll be that. Share the link. And we'll, yeah. I'll be sharing the video also. Yeah. Uh, pretty soon, so. If there are more, no more questions, I had uh, uh, an ide idea in mind. Uh, I'm not sure how to exactly do that, which is very common, that uh, I'm starting doing things that I don't know how to do, but I'm learning on the way.